Hello, I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and welcome to In Conversation With, the podcast series that delves into the world of financial services and brings you face-to-face with some of the most notable figures in the industry. Listen as we discuss topics that are currently facing the industry and hear from visionary CEOs to disruptive innovators as we bring you a diverse array of voices and perspectives. We'll explore the challenges they faced, the lessons they've learned, and the insights they have to share about the ever-evolving landscape of financial services. Hi, I'm Lois Vallely, Chief Reporter for Money Marketing, and today I am here with Peter Dalglish, who is Chief Investment Officer at Parmenian. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Very well, Lois. Thank you. Good, good. Um, So maybe to start off, you could introduce yourself and say a bit about how you got to where you are today. Yes. um, I mean, I joined financial services um, 30 years ago, uh, pretty much. Um, My type of job for life was into an institution called Bearings. Um, That came to a slight premature end uh, with Nick Gleason. Um, uh, But actually, like all these things, every cloud has a silver lining. And I moved on to uh, Jupiter. um, and I was focused on the Asia Pacific uh, and subsequently the emerging market space. Um, I moved through a variety of different organizations. Uh, from Jupiter through to Gartmore, F and C. Um, and then um, we as a family made it to a, a lifestyle change out of London. And uh, I was looking for a role closer to home. We moved down to the southwest near Bristol. Uh, and a very old colleague point, pointed me towards uh, an organization which was relatively new at that point in time, Parmenian, um, uh, which was focused on the retail Market space, and it's been a, a very steep learning curve ever since. Uh, and it continues to represent its challenges, but also its opportunities. Um, and we continue to uh, put forward our positions uh, and have support advisors uh, in a scalable and efficient manner uh, for the benefit of, the, of their clients. Excellent. So, as chief investment officer, what does your role sort of look like on a day to day basis at Parmenian? <laughs> Um, it's a variety of uh, roles from, you know, to a looking at the macro um, through to the underlying funds that we hold for each of the asset classes and thinking about where the risks lie, uh, both on the upside as well as the downside, and to what extent those correlations between uh, the asset classes are working or not. Um, and uh, therefore, to what extent, you know, to, are we confident uh, in delivering the consistency of risk adjusted returns that we endeavor to deliver for advisors and their clients? Um, it is overlaid with, uh, I have, uh, I sit on the executive committee, so there is a, a number of, sort of strategic uh, responsibilities that I carry as well. Um, but the primary focus is on uh, the, the management of uh, and the oversight of our investment solutions, as well as the communication. Communication is a core component. Um, the, you really can't provide enough information uh, to advisors and their clients in order to be able to assure them, because markets don't go up in a straight line, um, mm. of where things are going right, but also where things are going not so right. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I'm always interested by the um, the graphs that are made of really long term, you know, investment trends and how it's always going up, but very yeah. raggedy line. <laughs> um, yeah, they, so I know they, they can seal um, a, a number of small and nuanced uh, cycles mm. within that long-term trend. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I know Parmenian recently announced some changes to its tactical asset allocations. So could you just tell us a bit about why um, you made those changes, and also a bit about what the outlook is for 2024? Yes, um, I mean we've been wary. Uh, that after the to a fastest pace of interest rate rises since the 1980s, risks uh, to global growth uh, were, were skewed to the downside, was our concern. Uh, however, what we've seen is that uh, actually economies have held up much better than expected, uh, especially in the US, uh, where the strength and resilience in the labor market has uh, underpinned consumption. Uh, as And then that's ultimately fed through into corporate earnings, which have delivered typically to a solid mid-single digit, albeit very much driven by the Magnificent Seven, which we're all so also all too well aware of. Um, mm. But coupled with that, you know, so inflation has uh, been continuing to trend lower, 
uh, albeit more slowly of late. And we're increasingly minded that any sort of economic slowdown is likely to be sort of short and shallow. And therefore, we can start to look forward to the prospect of an improved growth outlook into the latter part of this year, but specifically into 2025 and probably into 2026, as some of the interest rates roll off from their peaks. But this is all really quite encouraging from an investor's point of view at a high level. Mm. Uh, but the challenge, as always, is to try and figure out you know, to what, to what extent is that already discounted in the markets? And to this extent, uh, whilst we're more positive looking forward, we are also cognizant that a, a lot of uh, that optimism is, it's it's beginning to be factored into certain areas within equities and fixed income. So I think your know, care and selectivity is definitely required, um, as well as looking to incorporate some hedges uh, in case a softer than expected outcome does actually come about. So in terms of our activities, uh, we've been looking to add uh, some risk within our solutions, um, but we've got a much greater comfort of leaning into those uh, areas that have lagged, uh, but which also should benefit if a soft landing does actually happen. And in this case, it's we think to a mid and small caps are such an area of great interest. Uh, so this is what we've been adding to uh, within the portfolios, uh, funded by uh, reduction in cash. Um, we believe mid and small caps offer really good good value for long term investors, and that they're effectively priced for a recession. Mm. Um, and what's more, you know, if if interest rates do actually start to come down, uh, they'll be one of the greatest beneficiaries as their cost of debt is typically uh, closely linked to floating rates. Okay, interesting. And so this um, move towards um, this increased exposure to global small caps, do you think this is a sort of move away from liquid or cash funds? And in your opinion, should advisors be, uh, as it were, like dipping their toes back into equities? Yeah, I think um, that on the surface, you know, that there has been a flight to safety. Uh, through 2023 um, on the back of what was a really difficult 2022. Mm. Um, and some of those yields that became available for uh, fixed deposits uh, were really very interesting and very attractive for many investors. Um, and so uh, that doesn't surprise that that trend occurred. And our own money market solution called PIM Sterling you know, currently has a yield of 5.28%, which again, on the surface, that's really actually very attractive. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the expectation is that central banks are increasingly gaining scope and latitude uh, to cut rates. Mm -hmm. And that was very much evident in recent central bank meetings over the last uh, few couple of weeks. Uh, and what that means is that for those uh, investors currently in money market funds uh, with fixed earned deposits, uh, there's a reinvestment risk. Uh, as those mature, mm -hmm. you know, what will the rates be when they look to reinvest those monies? And that is what we mean by reinvestment risk. And it's going to be lower than it's likely to be lower than what it's currently at. Uh, and at a point in time when nominal yields uh, in fixed interest are attractive, it means that that opportunity cost uh, for those investors actually is is incrementally in, is set to increase. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, I think the, the reset in bond yields um, uh, for investors offers them an, uh, an opportunity to not only uh, capture an attractive nominal yield, but also, importantly, the scope for capital appreciation as mm -hmm. rates come down. And, and if, if economies were to slow, we would expect the defensive characteristics of bonds to offer investors greater diversification as correlations with equities fall, or they may even move negative. So I think those are the type of dynamics that we're thinking about. Um, and you know, to what we can see that the material um, monies that have gone into money market funds, you know, to the, the number that is bandied around six trillion dollars in money market funds, um, of which, putting in that in percentage terms, through 2023, that grew. Uh, it's just in excess of 25 percent. Mm -hmm. you know, I am of the opinion that uh, as rates slowly come down. 
that those monies will look to find their way into equities and fixed interest, but probably start off with fixed interest. Uh, but for the more braver individuals, they'll be interested in the the equity side of things. Um, so that is probably leans into your second question. You know, to do should uh, to what extent should we be comfortable about dipping our toes back into fixed interest and equities? Um, yeah. I think there are there are a couple of other things to bear in mind. Is that um, from a cyclical perspective, you know, we we are increasingly seeing signs that slowdown in global growth looks like it is going to be relatively modest and short in its duration. Um, and so as we look forward into 2025 and into 2026, uh, growth does look uh, as if it's set to improve, which will help support corporate earnings and thereby company share prices, typically speaking. Yeah. Um, and you know, for that reason, uh, uh, we think equities are looking more increasingly more uh, interesting. Um, I think the second aspect is what we've already touched on, which is you know inflation. You know, is showing a downward drift, um, and that trend is likely to be to persist, albeit with some bumps along the way, which will allow central banks uh, to reduce uh, their restrictive policies, um, and that with lower interest rates, that will tend to be good fixed interest as well as equity valuations. Um, mm-hmm. So those are some of the uh, factors that we're considering um, as to why at this particular point in time um, we are increasingly, um, albeit still wary, we're increasingly to optimistic that looking forward on that longer term perspective, things are uh, set to improve. Interesting. That sounds quite positive from a personal perspective because I checked my pension the other day. I've got it in this sort of um, uh, not high risk, but sort of it adjusts according to what's going on in the world. And, and the majority of it seems to be in equities at the moment. So hopefully it'll be positive for me. Um, so 2024 has been dubbed the ultimate election year. Um, I think there's like something like 64 countries that are having elections and the European Union, obviously. Um, and obviously here in the UK, we've got one due at some point in this year. Um, so should advisors be concerned about these upcoming elections leading to market volatility, do you think? Um, so I think it's always prudent to be on the lookout for the unexpected and elections definitely fall into this category, I think, of of over recent years, that's probably all the more relevant and pertinent than, you know, to a looking back over longer time horizon. Um, but what I think is really uh, important for investors to bear in mind is that when you look at history, uh, generally markets, they tend to look through the political noise. And they fo- why is because markets are really focused on the long term prospect for growth, for inflation and interest rates. Um, and as a result, my inclination is that you know, elections are going to make for busy newspaper headlines, um, but unlikely to, to extend much beyond that from an investor's point of view. Mm. None, nonetheless, there, there is a, a need to keep a watchful eye out for unexpected changes in policy just in case. And I suppose that to a final aspect to and we really can't afford to be complacent let let please don't uh, or, or do hear that message is that of those elections that have already occurred so far year to date they've actually not the outcome hasn't necessarily been what the markets were looking for but have the markets experienced you know um undue volatility I think the out the out the conclusion of that is probably not, and mm. so where would I refer us to? Yeah, you know, if we look at Taiwan, well, yeah, you know, the pro independence party DPP got into power. Uh, there was a a, a, a a wash of excitable um, press articles written uh, about what China would do on the back of that. Well, actually, it's turned out that it's been a bit of the shrug of the shoulders, and it's been business as usual as thus far. Uh, to always be careful, I'm setting up myself for a fall. Uh, but it would appear that a lot of these things, so long as they are well known about in the marketplace and therefore reasonably well understood, and dare I say it, discounted, then the markets aren't aren't really going to be unduly perturbed. Now, 
bear in mind that we we did have a, a trust Quarteng experience um, not that long ago. You know, it, 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 yeah. it's, prud- it's prudent and appropriate for us to to not lose sight of that. If you get significant policy change, then that is something that we do need to be really wary or or or, or on or on the lookout for. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And of course, investing is for the long term, so. A bit of short-term volatility shouldn't do too much damage, hopefully. Indeed. <laughs> um, so how do you consider political events impacting investment outlook and asset allocation decisions? Um, so as I said, yeah, to our, the focus is really much more around policy yeah. and our expectations for growth, for inflation and interest rates. And so, therefore, uh, in terms of uh, the the political cycle, um, we know that investors dislike uncertainty. And so, to a greater or less extent, continuity is a good thing. Um, Mm. But what I would be equally mindful of is that we also need to embrace change. Um, And I can look at the UK uh, as an example in that regard, uh, whereby you, we have um, a productivity problem, um, and we've had that for many years now. And whilst it's talked about at length, um, there doesn't seem to be a political appetite to really sort of grasp the nettle. And that is to our detriment from an international competitiveness perspective. But from what I can see, um, you know, to some of the proposed policies that have been floated around um, by the, you know, a, a Labour government were it to get into power, really to a, starts to give you some uh, confidence or uh, interest that some of that supply side reform that they're talking about would, could be actually quite important for improving the growth outlook on the back of enhancing UK productivity. So that's one thing. I think, uh, you know, to let's um, uh, call out the US. You know, the US, um, it depends which to a media outlook you to a look at in terms of, you know, to what's the, the poll ratings between Trump and Biden. Um, I, my, the latest um, uh, piece that I saw, once you strip out um, – you know, the the independents yeah. put puts Biden much closer to Trump. Um, so it it, it 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 will be a two horse race. Um, they're both known then they are both known entities. So the surprise factor, I think, is uh, unlikely to be there. Where uh, is there scope for positive or negative surprise? Um, it's. I think it's more in, from the perspective of um, I'm less worried about uh, Trump getting in and causing market disturbance and worries than I think some of the media would have us believe. Because I think a lot of, for example, the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act um, introduced by the Biden, you know, the, the greater proportion of the beneficiaries of that are actually de- uh, Republican states, right? So therefore, would Trump repeal that? I'm not quite so convinced. And um, none, notwithstanding that, he's you know, worried to get into power. I would, I would anticipate him to be very vocal uh, mm. in and somewhat provocative, but that I think on some of the underlying policies are unlikely to materially change, and therefore the growth trajectory for the US has probably continued to be one of somewhat of a slowdown for 24 before incrementally improving into 25 uh, and 26, where I think that there is going to be change were Trump to get in is uh, the undoubtedly, it's not undoubtedly, probably uh, the chairmanship of the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that he hasn't necessarily seen eye to eye with uh, Jay Powell in the past. And so therefore, it's prudent to assume that there's likely to be some change there, um, okay. and that will have a bearing on interest rates uh, and monetary policy. So that is something that does need to be borne in mind. Yeah, definitely. It's a race between two very old horses, isn't it? I feel like they need some, <laughs> some new blood or something. It is. I was. Um, it was floated to me because 
out of the whole of the US, are those really the two best presidential candidates? Um, and how many people was, live in the US? <laughs> well, indeed. Um, at, at which point maybe it was, you know, the retort was along the lines of, well, maybe the rest are just too sensible and they don't want to be president. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't if, if no. that was even possible. Anyway, um, <laughs> what's your view on the UK as an asset class? Should we be worried about home bias, in your opinion? Um, so I I think the, the flow of money out of the UK has been relentless and notably since 2016. Um, okay. And, and if we if we look at some of the stats on this, you know, to be UK weightings in uh, UK pension funds has collapsed from around about to a forty percent in the nineteen eighties to approximately five to six percent today. Um, wow. That that really does explain some of that that persistent outflow, but it's been coupled with you know UK open ended funds. Uh, have, have, they've now seen, I think it's um, thirty three months of consecutive outflows. Uh, that clearly hasn't been help by retail investors who have have redeemed um, partly due to that you know to a uh, historical high in terms of cost of living uh, and that cost of living crisis um, yeah. and they they've they've um, looked to try and make ends meet but what it has meant is that you know to valuations in the UK are now down to historical lows and that in of itself is interesting but a cheap valuation is never a sufficient catalyst uh, you need something else and that catalyst is is hard to identify, um, but I will point to a, a few reasons as to why things I think are set to sequentially improve. So, mm -hmm. firstly, uh, inflation. Um, we're expected to get close to target, the two percent target, and you know, to some who are expecting even that to come about uh, in this month, so the month of April. So the, that'll mm -hmm. be announced in May. Um, I'm probably a bit more. Uh, guarded in that. So let's say early summer, at which point yeah, the Bank of England uh, is likely to have the wherewithal to be able to reduce rates. And that will act as a support to not only liquidity, but also valuations. Uh, a second aspect is in terms of positive real incomes. Uh, we've come through a period with that very um, uh, difficult um, cost of living, um, whereby government uh, sorry, household incomes have been really squeezed. Well, we're now on the prospect with declining inflation for those incomes in real terms to turn notably positive, um, which when combined with a revival in the housing market, which we're already beginning to see signs of, is lifting consumer confidence, uh, which is likely to lead to better than expected GDP growth. You know, to a you can, I think that the OBR had been forecasting around about 0.7%. Well, were this all to manifest itself, I can see it. There's every reason why GDP growth will be comfortably in excess of 1% through 2024 with considerable scope for upside above that. And what that will therefore feed into is corporate earnings surprises. Um, the Another aspect, and the sort of third aspect, is um, you know, improvement in global cyclical uh, trajectory. And what that means for an index like the UK is, which has that cyclical bias to it in terms of energy, mining, industrials, consumer discretionary, mm. that actually the UK market is probably reasonably well positioned to enjoy the fruits of that global cyclical improvement. So I suppose in aggregate, you know, it's for a market that is so unloved, underowned, oversold, and with such depressed expectations amongst investors there is i think there's an increasing probability of positive surprise uh, which could that should ordinarily lead to a narrowing of that valuation differential versus some of the the other developed markets but specifically the us uh, given its out stellar out performance mm -hmm. so you know from our point of view you know we have been underweight the uk uh, but it is a marketplace that we are increasingly looking um, to add to at the margin. And we've already started that through that increased allocation specifically to global uh, small caps, which incorporates a, a healthy chunk of UK. Mm. OK. Um, and I just I do have to ask what your view on the UK ISA is. <laughs> 
I think it's um, it's well intentioned. Um, I think its effectiveness is more in doubt. Uh, why do mm -hmm. I say that? Is because I think the statistics are along the lines of around about only fifteen percent or mid mid teens of uh, investors actually use their maximum ISA allowance. So therefore, you know, the additional five on top is it's it's going to be great for those who can uh, afford that. Um, but in terms of its effectiveness on the market, I think it's, as I say, it's well well intentioned, but probably going to come short of on, on the delivery front. Where I would be more enthusiastic um, or encouraging, you know, the government or future governments to think about is, you know, to what extent can pension funds be required to have a higher weighting to the UK? And mm. that's a very controversial statement. Um, and I know there will be plenty of pushback that, um, uh, which I would ad adhere to, uh, and, and it, which is that, you know, to uh, having the flexibility to implement diversification is essential for you know, the delivery of good client outcomes. And I fully subscribe to that. But I think when I see UK pension funds at 5 to 6% in terms of the weighting, um, notwithstanding the fact that you know, sort of the global world index has the UK, I think it's around about sort of 35 to 4%, you know, that 5 to 6% indicates an overweight position. But nonetheless, unless we start to invest in our own companies, which don't forget, you know, specifically in the, in the FTSE 100, you know, over 70% of their earnings are international. Mm. And therefore, are you buying purely UK companies? The answer, simple answer to that is no. Then actually you're encouraging investment into um, UK listed companies, which will help their cost of capital, which will improve competitiveness, which will help GDP growth, help uh, employment growth, et cetera. And that's why I think I'm more... Uh, minded that that would be an effective and constructive uh, path to take. Yeah, definitely. No, it's a good point as well about um, a lot of it being like not purely UK, a lot of companies, because that was one of the points that I heard when the UK ISA came out, like how is it even going to be vetted? But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I think, the, I think the, that, that's part of the reason why that consultation period is, uh, or process is being um gone into yeah. um and i i think that'll be a hard one to overcome um but we'll see hmm. we will and we'll have to end it there i'm afraid but it's been really good to talk to you thank you so much peter i really enjoyed it not at all very thank you very much for having me Thank you for listening to In Conversation With. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.